Hello everyone and thanks so much for joining us here uh, this evening for the first in our Family Voices webinar series. Uh, my name is Roisin Eady, I'm the Communications Lead with Scottish Huntington's Association and hopefully you should also see um, our two other uh, guests today, well John Gregor, who some of you will know from Huntington's Disease Association in England and Wales, He's a specialist HD advisor. Um, he's co-presenting with me this evening. And you should also see the very wonderful Melanie Pearson there, um, who's giving you a wave right now, um, who's going to be sharing her experiences uh, with us um, of growing up in a family impacted by Huntington's disease, uh, being a carer for her, her late brother, Nick, and also maybe telling us a wee bit about um, what motivated her to write uh, her book, Somebody Up There Likes Me, which uh, if any of you have checked it out on Amazon, five star reviews the whole way. So, um, so as I said, this is the first in our series of Family Voices events. And um, it's it was a way for the, the four Huntington Cities charities to bring the wider community together and maybe share some experiences and learn from one another. So I think without any further ado, um, I'd like to introduce you to Melanie, um, who's going to begin by reading an extract from her book. Um, the, the piece that Melanie has chosen, um, it's a, a very um, moving moment when uh, Melanie first began to suspect that her brother Nick was develop developing symptoms of the disease and, and she started to wonder how she was going to address that. So Melanie, if I just pass over to you now, please. Thank you so much and thanks to everybody who's joined us tonight. Um, yeah, I'm going to start with a very uh, quick uh, reading um, and it's about the moment I noticed just something amiss and I was waiting for a train to pull into Durham station and my brother was on the, was on the platform as I was on the train and this is the excerpt from the book that I wrote at the time. As my train chugged over the bridge with its lovely view of Durham Cathedral, I was looking forward to seeing Nick slipping back into our usual routine of banter and in-jokes, gossip about family and friends, and all the silly little things we'd saved up to tell each other. It was always a sort of homecoming to spend time together again. But there's sometimes a strangeness about suddenly seeing someone you know so well with pure objectivity. On this particular day, I saw my brother that way. This is the letter I wrote afterwards. I never intended to send it. I just needed to put my feelings into words. To my dear brother, I saw you yesterday, though you didn't see me. I saw you for a whole minute as my train pulled in slowly to the platform and you were there waiting. And it was a shock, the way you might sometimes catch sight of someone you know very well in an unexpected place and see them as you would a complete stranger. I saw you that way and it scared me. I think I saw the signs of something I've been secretly dreading for a long time. How thin you've become, hollow faced and gaunt. The way you moved your head, a tiny wobble of your neck an involuntary twitch, and then another. The first small signs of our family curse, the illness that there is no cure for. We knew that out of the two of us, in all probability, one of us was going to inherit the disease. It was too much to hope for, for us both to escape it. But which one of us, you or me? Better just not to think about it. For the last few years, I've had a low key dread in the pit of my stomach. Mostly, I ignore it because you seem fine on the phone and we laugh a lot as we always do and tell stupid jokes that no one else would understand. And you sound like someone who believes he has a future. But do you know something that I don't? Thanks very much, Mel. That's a, that's a, a moment that quite a few people on the call might feel that, that they recognise in, in their own way. Um, just to sort of go to the start of things, we really wanted to ask you, so what was it that, that inspired you to write the book? I wonder if you could say a little bit about so what, what it was that made you decide to do that? Sure. Um, well, I was always one of those people that wrote a diary and I ended up after that, uh, after that moment, my brother did go on to inherit the illness and develop 
symptoms that got worse and I did become his carer which was something I hadn't really expected to do um, but uh, when he died which was very suddenly um, and luckily before the uh, pandemic happened I suddenly realised that it was just me left in our family and that of the family that I'd grown up with there was only me left to tell the story and I'd written a blog about being a carer, which had really helped me to sort of find a way through that. But my brother had also written a diary most of his life until he got ill. And between us, I think we really both wanted to tell the story of what it's like to grow up in this uh, situation. And because it's just me, I realised that I had to do it. And I think it was literally the day after my brother had died, I thought... Now I've got to write my book. And in a way, lockdown was very useful because it became my lockdown project. I didn't bake any bread, but I wrote a book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see, I was going to ask you, Melanie, how easy it was for you to recall memories from the past, but now knowing that you wrote a diary, um, and also Nick wrote a diary, I, I can see, but, but I guess if you have all this information and you have all these moments that you've documented as they happen how did you then how were you able then to go through it and decide what you would use in the book and what you wouldn't use in the book tough yeah it was a, that was quite a tough one because I had written a blog but some of that was very personal it was never really intended for anybody else but I did end up sharing it on Twitter which was very very helpful because it put me in touch with an amazing supportive community of carers and other people from Huntington's families. Um, it's still quite a private sort of form of expression because I didn't really expect many other people to see it. It was just people who really knew the score. And then how I really saw it was like a series of snapshots in a family photo album. And I think some moments just became really clear as sort of stepping stones in, in our family story. Yeah. And of course, in the, in the photo album of our family lives, an extra member did gradually start to make their presence, which was the illness. Yeah. yeah. Now that sort of leads on a little bit to what I was going to ask when you talk about some snapshots of um the past because uh, there's, there's, there's a part in your book where you describe him being on holiday in scotland and it's just children and there's a point where you become aware because of because of how of how your, your mum's behaving that your, your family's a bit different Mm. And I wonder if you would say a, a little bit about that. I, I know I think you're going to read a little bit about it's that. It's my episode. next reading, <laughs> folks. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think, oh, I, I, I think when our mum was diagnosed with Huntington's, we'd never heard of it. We didn't have any history in the family that we knew um because just just because of the circumstances of um my mum was an only child her father had died quite young in the war and um we didn't really quite know who to look out for in our family tree there didn't seem to be any obvious uh, patterns for it so we were kind of really at a loss to know what was happening to mom and it was a very steep learning curve so all we knew was that we needed to kind of come together as a family and and protect her and protect ourselves because it was it was you know unknown territory and quite scary but i think one of the reasons i have written a book is about how this illness can really really tear families apart and how important it is if 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 you can to find ways to stick together or to find your tribe in some way and obviously that's easier said than done um so 
I think in our case, we were really lucky that we did have a strong bond and we, we wanted to support each other, but we didn't really know how to do it either. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder... I, sorry, carry oh, on. Sorry. No, so you, are you going to say something? No, I, I was just, I was just going to ask, I know in the book, like you talk about um, maybe you, the, your, your mum's behaviours were different. You, yeah. You no, know, and I was yeah. just wondering what kind of behaviours they were. And also, um, there's an interesting um, moment when you and Nick, um, you stop calling yeah. your mother and mum and you, you start to call her ma instead. Can you explain a wee bit more about that? Yeah, I think for a start, when mum got her diagnosis, uh, we were sort of late teenagers. So we were, we were kind of over calling her mummy and we kind of needed, me and my brother were very close. We sort of needed a, a set of our own language and our own words for things. And we did have nicknames for everybody in our lives really, um, including my dad <laughs> who we called Craddock for some reason. I've no idea why. And, and mom kind of also needed her nickname, but it was difficult to, it was difficult to call her something cuddly because she had started to become like a different person and she wasn't like a cuddly mummy anymore who could look after us. She'd, she'd started to become very erratic in her moods and she had these really quite scary um, obsessions with things and she'd, yeah, just, 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 sometimes be quite scary in public you know especially as teenagers we really didn't know where to put ourselves and at the same time we wanted to not totally dissociate ourselves so it was sort of helpful to have another name for her that was a you know it was like a variation on on saying yeah. mom but it and because we're, we're from an Irish background originally so it's a bit like mammy but we called her yeah. mom <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't really know where it came from but it just helped to kind of place her so she was like this character that we we kind mm. of knew how to deal with more than if she'd been our mom who was meant to be looking after us but wasn't yeah. I, th I think you were going to read another extract from your book that kind of maybe yeah. goes into that a wee bit yeah, and this is a this is a, a kind of it is part of the sort of idea of a snapshot, and this is part of something I wrote um, about what a difference ten years can make. So it starts in 1979 when she, I think she was either on the point of diagnosis or or had just it had just happened, and it was very very new, and her strange behaviours have been getting more and more pronounced so yeah this is 1979 on holiday in Scotland we've just left a hotel at nine o'clock at night because my mom refused point blank to spend another moment there having checked in earlier she suddenly decided there was something horribly wrong with the place that she wouldn't sleep a wink in that room and would not stay when Ma gets an idea in her head about something that's it Right now, she has a bad feeling about this place and she needs to leave this minute. And true enough, as we finally check out, we discover that there's been a death in the room next door and we actually see the ambulance and the body being taken away, covered in a sheet. And true enough, my mum does have a sixth sense about many things, but she's also becoming a social liability. What's the matter with her? Something is not quite right. In Edinburgh, she totters unevenly along the pavement in unsuitable heels, talcum powder erupting bizarrely from her shoes at every step, speech just slightly stir slurred. A boy nudges his friend and points. Look at her, she's steaming. They think she's drunk and she's not. It's not even lunchtime. We silently close rank and we rise to her defense, but we're embarrassed too. Her obsessions, like the copious talcum powder and her sudden frightening bursts of hysteria, are things that distance her and make it hard for me to draw near. It's hard to confide in someone who 
One minute is gentle and chatty and ready to listen, and the next wailing like a banshee. 1989. Ma sits like a broken doll in her high, pink high back chair. What kind of suit would you like today? I ask her. Shick oh, she can barely get the word out. I prop another cushion behind her back. Everything in this room is broken or stained. Ma has so many accidents. Today, she can't get comfortable. Her voice rises anxiously as I stir the soup in the kitchen next door. She doesn't like to be left alone for long. My dad's in hospital overnight for a minor operation and none of us are happy with the idea of mom going into respite care. So I take time off and come up from London to tend to her for a week. Looking at her delicate skull and a thin white hair that was once so wavy and rich, I feed her soup a little bit at a time with a baby's plastic spoon and feel a mixture of emotions, pity, guilt, rage, revulsion sometimes, love much of the time, sorrow all the time. Thanks very much. And there's a picture there of your, of your mum in, is it the 1950s, Mel, I think? Yeah. Um, one thing we're interested to ask you, because in the book you describe a couple of instances where it puts across some of the, the the stigma around Huntington's. I think you mentioned it. You mentioned an incident where um, some family friends <gasps> suggested oh, gosh, suggested that that the Huntington's was a, was was a, as a result of something to do with sin. And then, and then the, which is sort of like quite a dramatic thing to happen. And then another more low key incident where, 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 where your mum went to hospital and there was a sort of a suggestion that the injuries that should occurred should, should um, gain as a, on account of the movement and falling over were to do with um, maybe she'd been abused. So the, the two different sort of ends of, 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 of sort of misunderstanding and, um, but how do, I was just really the question I was getting to is how do you cope with that as a family? I think it was really difficult because um, even medical professionals didn't have very much information. You know, with a rare illness um, in days without the internet as well, there wasn't a lot of information that wasn't clinical information, and that was quite hard hitting. There wasn't really uh, much of a patient forum or anything like that. And um, the Huntington's Disease Association was still quite small. Um, it, it was really difficult to, uh, well, to find ways to explain to people. So I always say my dad was an absolute saint because he dealt with this really, really calmly. <laughs> And I don't know how it affected him internally, but he was so brave and he just really stood up to people. So the time that the uh, the friends wanted to pray for my mum and say, you know, that her illness was the result of sin, um, I think he had to really, really probably be very tactful and in some ways there's the kind of lucky thing of with Huntington's you know some of the social niceties go out the window anyway so I think he had an excuse to withdraw but the time in hospital um Ma had fallen downstairs and there is a picture of her that I didn't put in the book because it's quite shocking where she's got a black eye and a split lip and you know she looks a mess and it's just almost an everyday incident um, and the medical social workers took my dad to one side and said uh, you know we need to we need to have a word with you and of course mum didn't like being left on her own without him she was dependent on him so that made it even worse because she was obviously distressed and they you know they have to take these things seriously but they must have seen her medical notes but something didn't add up so um, yeah, there was a lot of raising awareness that I think he had to do on his own, my dad. Um, and he was very brave about it. So, uh, you know, there were still many battles to fight in that respect, eh? Yes. You know, yeah, people still don't know enough. Yeah, yeah. 
and and it can I guess you know when you, when you you see the changes that are taking place in your mum mm. and you have um you're also you know you, you see your dad having to care for her and and stick up for her and she's she's so different from the the, the mum maybe from when you were much younger um you have all this trauma going on but then you also have the fear um that you could also develop Huntington's disease um and you say in your book that that you always assumed it would be you who inherited the gene um and not Nick so can you say a wee bit about the effect that kind of living with this idea or fear that you would you that, that you would go on to have the disease you know the kind of impact that that had on any decisions that you made in your life well absolutely massive impact um I think again the 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 saintliness of our dad was that I think he he did read all the clinical information and I think he he understood what was possibly in store very early on and he really encouraged me and my brother to just I suppose to step away from worrying about it and I do remember also the Huntington's disease advisor that we saw after mum died said look just live your lives but that's easier said than done so I think the biggest impact it had on me was kind of carrying some uh some fatalistic uh sense that um maybe I shouldn't get too invested in uh I suppose a career or a relationship that was going to last certainly with relationships I just thought I'm not going to have children you know there's absolutely no way I'm going to bring another life into this family if this is what is you know the family pattern now I, I, I absolutely believe that this is a personal decision that everybody has a right to make themselves and people you know really really need to make their own decisions about children so I'm not judging anybody else who decides that they want to do that but for me it was so out of the question that I think it really just determined my life choices a lot and I think I was very um uh I don't know I always sort of felt as if I was living out on the edges of things my brother did seem to think differently and he he just went wholeheartedly into a, a really good career. He had lots of relationships. He was quite keen to have children and then he did. You know, we, we did seem to think differently about it. Um, so in the end, when the genetic testing became available, I just thought, yeah, I want to know for sure because I'd already lived so much of my life in the light of believing this was gonna happen. So I may as well kind of, I may as well, you know, confirm it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I was gonna ask you about how, how you felt when you got a, a negative test result, because you did obviously you yeah. and, and I think you might be read a little bit of that as well about yeah, yeah. Because do you do you want me to go ahead with that now? I'll, I'll read. I, I think that would make sense if you maybe if you just read that little yeah. bit about when when you you know you, about after you got the results. Yeah. Well, spoiler alert, folks. Here I am, and you know, with amazing gratitude, I'm 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 here to tell the tale, and uh, I really didn't expect that. Um, I did have the the the. Uh, the test um, and got a clear result um, and it was really surprising how how flat I felt afterwards and this is this is about that survivor's guilt is now a recognized side effect in people who've taken the predictive test and been pronounced clear of Huntington's the knowledge that you have dodged the bullet produces a complex set of unwieldy emotions the bullet may still be heading for someone else in your family and you are powerless to save them. In many cases, it takes the form of post-traumatic stress disorder with the same symptoms as someone who's experienced an actual catastrophic event. Well, in many ways, you have. If you've made your life decisions in the shadow of a terminal illness up to the point of reading the result, 
and then had to completely reconsider your options, your values and expectations, you might be shocked to find that you are not elated. You're supposed to be happy. Of course you're happy, but also exhausted, flattened and depressed. It can in fact send you a little round the twist. I didn't know any of this at the time. I just thought it was me. I felt very confused and low that autumn. And crazy though it might sound, I had so many strange feelings about not having inherited Huntington's disease. It was like being released from a life sentence in prison, blinking in the sunlight with a handful of the same coins you'd had in your pocket years ago, no longer a valid currency. Like walking away from jail with the whole gigantic world stretching around you and no one to meet you or show you the way. Now, I realize that following your own release, the life sentence still hangs over you if you have siblings or anyone else in the family who could be affected. It's a complex emotional state to be in. I'd wondered what my all clear from Huntington's could mean for Nick and then shoved the thought away, but it was always there, silently growing in my cells. Throughout my adult life so far, I'd always thought that I would be the one who developed the disease. I'd not wanted it to be me, but I'd expected it. So it wasn't me, why wasn't it? No wonder I was confused. Oh, my goodness. Um, I, I, you know, you, you talk about um, there about, about Nick and your responses, well, if I've, as you say, dodged the bullet, what does this mean for Nick? But you just yeah. push that thought to the back of your head. And I guess that's one of the examples where, where in families and even amongst siblings as close as you were with Nick and as much as you admired um, your father for his bravery, there's still a difficulty about talking about Huntington's disease, about yeah. talking about the illness and about potentially noticing um, symptoms developing in, in family members. Can you say, and, and I know you started um, the, this uh, the webinar with, with this, you know, having noticed some changes in Nick. Can you tell us a wee bit more about when you started noticing changes and how you then kind of were able to approach that with Nick? And did he know there was changes? Yeah, it's, it's so hard because I think because the illness has such a long, slow onset, and then it suddenly escalates. And in a way, if you have got some family pattern, you're kind of expecting it. It's really hard to know whether your mind is playing tricks on you or not, because you don't want to believe it. You're expecting it, but you don't want to see it. And I think anybody who, like me, I did think for years, well, I'm going to develop Huntington's. And I did start to think, you know, if I got a, you know, like a, if you get a twitchy eye or a, um, like a jumpy leg, um, you know, I used to think, is this it? Is this it? Every time I dropped a plate, I think, is this it? Are we starting now? There's that kind of thing going on. And yet, the signs sometimes of another person are sometimes so subtle and so slow burning that it's like you're seeing stuff, but you don't really know if you're seeing for real. And if it's just like a nervous tick and it's a one-off and things like um, oh, off, just out of character behavior, that started happening with my brother. But for a long time, because other things had been going on in his life, like he'd changed jobs, he split up with his wife, we just put it down to depression and difficult times. And it's, it's bonkers really how you can be on the lookout for something and not see it. You know, I call it the elephant in the room because in our family, we, we could see it happening. And we sometimes talked about it with each other, me and my dad in particular, but we just couldn't address it. Partly because my brother had always been really clear that if he thought he did have the illness, He'd kill himself because he didn't want to end up like mom. And that's a pretty strong statement to make. And it's why he didn't want to have the test either. And I just thought, if I say anything, then 
I don't know what he might do. And I was so afraid of that, that it was easier to, to just shut up and have these doubts. And it was another reason why I started keeping a diary about specific things, because I just couldn't quite believe my eyes. And I didn't want to. Um, yeah. yeah. For, just to follow on from that, Mel, you, I, I know that you say in the book, when Mick, when Nick finally did sort of admit to himself that he had symptoms, that it, that it was almost like a, a relief to him in, in terms of ending sort of the uncertainty. And, um, and I, I suppose people might find that quite an odd thing to say today. It was a relief to find that out, but I wonder if you could say a little bit about that. Well, again, I think because uh, of, although I'd carried this um, kind of shadow around my shoulders for so many years thinking, well, I'm going to inherit the illness. Um, I think he had in his own way too, it was just he had a different way of looking at it. And I think for him, it had manifested in a lot of, a lot of avoidance. Um, he just decided he wasn't going to think about it. Um, but something had been there in the background. So he'd always been prone to depression and um, a lot of, you know, quite uh, dangerous behaviour, like he'd always driven too fast. He wrote about this in his diary and it's something I, I found in his diaries after he died. He, you know, he'd said, he thought he'd always been courting danger just because he wanted to put two fingers up at, you know, the the illness that was waiting in the wings, uh, but he couldn't actually admit that it might be. You know, it's a really weird set of paradoxes. So I think that takes up so much energy when you're really, really not looking at something and you're turning your back on it and you're doing everything you can to not think about it. In some ways, when you actually just go, hmm, you know, maybe, I think it is a relief. And I think for him, I think he knew for quite a long time and he just wouldn't admit it. Yeah. And it it sort of had to come from him. Though it was a chance comment that somebody else made and just said, well, you know, what's wrong with you, mate? You know, what what is this? What is this twitch that you've got? And I think for him, that's when he just went, yeah. And that it was a sense of acceptance that you know, again, sounds like a paradox. You wouldn't expect it, but he, he just spent so long fighting it. It was just quite sweet to give in to going, yeah, here we are. And also to realise that he didn't want to kill himself. He wanted to live. And that was very clear as well. You know, he really, really wanted to live. And whatever that meant, he was up for it. And again, I think it shows that you just don't know what, reaction you're going to have until it comes yeah 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 um, hard for everybody else in the family though yeah <laughs> I, I, I was just going to come on to that mel because because yeah. um um it's sort of you know our, our it's it's our awareness month this month and, and the theme mm. in mental health and um we had to talk a very interesting talk last week about how it mental health and Huntington's isn't just about the person who has yeah. been it's about the it exists within like the family so everyone's mental health sort of impacts on everyone else's mental health and um um I wonder if you could sort of recognize that dynamic in your family hugely yeah hugely because there's always going to be some stress about waiting for the next phase to happen you know so um, I think pre-symptomatic, you know, pre-diagnosis, um, pre-physical symptoms, I mean, you know, people seem to sometimes do some really weird stuff. In my brother's case, he had a lot of car accidents and he was always a really fast driver and quite a dangerous driver. So that was no surprise in a way, but there were other uh, things that, uh, it was hard to actually put a finger on, but he just seemed to get himself into these quite reckless situations. And it did impact on his wife and, and children, I think. Um, and so they, you know, so his wife had to hold it together. And again, probably not really knowing quite what was going on. Um, 
I think me and my dad eventually had to bail him out because he got into a tremendous amount of debt and he hadn't told anybody about it. And I think that's fairly common. You know, people um, kind of start losing some of their inhibitions and start spending recklessly and thinking, yeah, I'm going to go on holiday, you know, and, and book a holiday that they absolutely can't afford. And there's just lots and lots of things that just you know, might have a financial impact or an emotional impact. And it's really hard to know how to deal with that because you don't have any kind of user's manual or rule book. You don't know what direction it's going to come from. You just know that the person you love is behaving oddly. And it's it's up to the rest of the family to kind of find their, you know, their ways of dealing with that. So... It's pretty huge. I, I, it's not surprising that a lot of families do find they just can't stand the pace. Yes. Yeah. And of course, if you're caring for somebody who is actually um, physically symptomatic, that's a massive impact on your life as well because everything changes then. I mean, just, just to pick up on that um, yeah. caring aspect, Melanie, um, in the book, you talk about um, how society doesn't really understand what it means to be a carer. Mm. And um, you, you quote a friend um, who's caring for their father who says, even nice people don't understand what this is, um, how this affects your life. Yeah. Um, and I know you also have worked in health and social care as well. So you have a broad experience of this. Um, in, in, um, in your opinion, what do you think needs to change in terms of supporting carers and how best they can be helped in these situations. How long have you got? <laughs> <laughs> a a, yeah, a lot needs to change, goodness. Um, I think the big issue that, that is really tricky is that the majority of, of, of family caring is invisible. You know, so much of it happens behind closed doors and it's really hard to see exactly what goes on um, and it's 24 seven. So it's hard to explain to somebody, well, I do this, 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 because it's, it is endless. Um, so there is that, I think there is a, there is definitely a sort of, um, even nice people, it's true, um, people who really want to help find it really hard to think, we all think this is never gonna happen to us. You know, the, the statistics of how many of us are gonna be cared for or become a carer are, you know, they're growing all the time, especially after the pandemic. So it's something really uncomfortable to look at, whether it's Huntington's or some other long-term disability. Um, and no, no one wants to think of their lives being impacted to that extent because it really is enormous. It doesn't have to be all bad, but it is it is such a big thing that I don't think society is really quite able to, to see it sometimes because it's so big. Um, and in a more practical sense, my big beef was always that mainstream organizations and even health services were simply not joined up and they're not joined up to support the the user and certainly not for the carer even though things are getting better but it everything is such a struggle you know from having to apply for a blue badge which i'm eternally grateful john you did that for for my brother um you know because the paperwork is immense the things that carers have to do in their own time, which is very limited, um, that really could and should be uh, just shortened and picked up by other services. Really, you know, that I, I wish that could change because things don't join up or overlap and organizations with paid workers really really could benefit themselves by saving everybody time and money I think by you know just making it more easy to also listen to carers and listen to families because they have first-hand experience which 
probably tells you so much more than you know a lot of clinical information and 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 records that maybe a new professional has written that don't always reflect the whole situation with the person affected yeah so, <laughs> that's a start melby because we're, we're gonna stop in a minute and, and get, take some questions um but just before we do um I was hoping you might end. I know in the, in the book you describe uh, an incident at Christmas about a turkey, which um, mm. illustrates really well two things. Really illustrates sort of the difficulty when you know people start to become symptomatic around some sort of planning things, and, and and also shows really well the importance of being flexible and adapting. So I wonder if you would read that bit out to, to finish with. And I think also, you know, I do want to say there's a lot of black humour and sort of silliness involved in these situations. And I think it is one of the only ways, you know, we, we, we get through this, both, you know, looking in terms of being a sufferer and a, and a carer and a family member, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of humour in there amidst all the other stuff. Um, so this is about a Christmas uh, uh, story before before my brother, uh, while he could still live quite independently, we'd arranged to go and uh, see him at Christmas with his children. And um, Nick said he would cook a turkey and to leave it to him. I must have been a wee bit doubtful, but by now he had a, a, a lovely woman doing a lot of his shopping and it had made such a difference to his well-being. He seemed to be coping really well. So we drove up north the day after Boxing Day. By the time we arrived, we were hungry. Simon's mum had pressed upon us a carrier bag full of cake, fruit, cheese, and anything else she said would otherwise go to waste. Mince pies, homemade cranberry sauce, leftover roasties, cocktail sausages, a stick of sprouts, some carrots, and a bottle of fizz. We were laden with goodies. Nick had said he'd provide everything else, so we just needed to bring ourselves and whatever we were drinking. At last, we locked on the door. There was great excitement to see each other and the children immediately tore into their presence while we opened the wine. Something was missing though. Oh yeah, where was that delicious scent of roasting meat? This was shortly before I became vegan. Shall I help you get the dinner on? I asked Nick. Okay, sis. We went into the kitchen. Where's your turkey, Nick? He fumbled in the fridge for what seemed a very long time and then produced a small cardboard package. Inside was a frozen turkey roll, clearly labelled as serves two. There were six of us. Simon came in ravenous after the drive, wanting to get dinner started. Shall we put the bird in the oven then, Nick? He didn't notice my frantic eyebrow wiggling and grimacing. Nick looked a bit shifty. He started twiddling knobs on the cooker while I rummaged in the cupboards and put the roll, looking smaller all the time, on a roasting tray. Nick fiddled about some more with the dials and then, it's not working at the moment. Okay, uh, what about the microwave? Another long silence. That's broken. And this is how the Huntington's brain works. In his mind, he was going to cook a turkey banquet for six people, even though what he actually had was a tiny chilled ready meal and no oven or microwave. His capacity for logical planning had simply closed down. There was no point in getting exasperated. We were way beyond that. Improvising, we cut the turkey roll into sheds with a thread, sorry, with a pair of scissors, and we put it in a pan to fry with some onions and then added the sausages. We made bubble and squeak in another pan with the leftover roasties, chopped the carrots raw into sticks, and the kids persuaded us to forget about the sprouts altogether. Meanwhile, the adults opened another bottle. There was lots of food to go round, and it was all delicious, and in the end much more fun. We had to work together and pull what could have been a disaster into a good time. The stuff that often makes a family gathering memorable, especially at Christmas. And Nick was the host with the most. But in the back of my mind, I knew that we were driving towards a cliff edge. We just couldn't gauge how far ahead or how long it might take. Thank you very much, Mel. I think that's a really good extract to, to end on.